So, um, let me see. Do we have audio? I didn't check that. I, I always love that I am kind of obliged to check this on stream. And I can't see it in... Yeah, yeah. It, it seems it is fine. It seems. So, with this set, we can properly almost start this, you know? Let me... Why do we have so many windows open? I am amazing. Mm. Transition, Pantheritis, hello everybody. <laughs> Here we are. Another beautiful night, another beautiful location, in another beautiful chance to keep progressing, to keep reading, to keep exploring, to keep going forward, you know? Because we have in front of us the beautiful Mahabharata, and we have the necessity or the interest at the very least of progressing even more based on where it is that we left the last time. So yeah, we... Before starting itself, I kind of um, skip talking about it. I just noticed uh, right now, well, not right now, when I finished the stream earlier, that I should have said <laughs> that, yeah, yesterday my internet died. Therefore, I didn't have the possibility of uh, probably finishing the list of topics. So, yeah, that is something that really happens. But aside from that, in a more proper man, sorry, now for real, hello, hello, hello. hello. Dear Lurkers, dear Bot Watchers, hello every single one. I hope we can have a, once again a great occasion. And in this particular occasion, also, let me do it more properly. Is the bot having problems or something like that? I cannot believe that I can see nor I can find the bot over here. What is going on with the bot? But well, I. Okay, okay, I am curious right now. Let me see. If I were to do... Is it going to work? Okay. Why is... What? I, I don't know. Um, it is and it is not working. So I, I don't know. The, whatever you want about. Hello. Hey, I from the bots. Mm, also, hello, Ronspoon. Hello, Strip Tansu. Welcome, welcome, welcome. We, we have a head of us the Mahabharata itself, so we shall try to start with this. Um, I, I was doing other things before really something, and while I set up everything else, let me, let me say this. I was doing other things, and because of that, I ended up eating the apple before stream, so this is kind of a sad day. We lost our beautiful apple, and yeah, we, we don't have the possibility of hearing me on a crunch on a beautiful apple, so yeah, this is so crazy, but well, aside from that, we, we are here, on the book itself, we are at Camp 151, let me see if I change, yeah, I am, I am, we are Camp 151, Saturija Parva continued, but the context, if I, if I am not wrong, it was, they were uh, escaping from the, yeah, okay, okay. the context is, uh, Kunti and her sons were persuaded by, I think it was, no, I can't remember, uh, by somebody basically who tried to kill them. And because of that, they ended up being taken to a house made of yak, so to speak, a flammable uh, substance. And because of that thing, and obviously due to the fact that they are so to speak, one of the most, um, I think it is clever, the word that they use here, because they are one of the most clever um, humans that there are in, in this story. They noticed they were put in a place that was made out of flammable things. And trying to pers per yeah, preserve their own lives, they ended up creating a tunnel and they ended up basically not only escaping, but right now, um, we are seeing, in reality, yeah, we are only seeing what is happening right now, because they simply escaped, and we know that um, they needed help of one of the biggest kids, let's say, they are a kid, and one of the biggest um, boys of the family, or one of the biggest men in that family, because they needed to escape, and they were already kind of tired, so yeah. All of that happened. Now we need to continue and we need to 
keep learning what it is that is happening right now. In a, well, before really starting, also in a more proper manner, we were dealing and we were analyzing and we were going over, so to speak, in other cantos. And personally, I'm not going to say it, it was something that happened with everyone, but personally, I really enjoyed Is it over here? Let me see. It is okay, it is a lot over. Um, let me see, let me see. Yeah, I think it is around Canto 146, 140. Let me see. Bishma de Dura, Nicaturiz, Dejara I can't find it, I can't find it. No, no, I can't find it. Fuck. But there was basically a really, really, really good, um, not one, a lot of paragraphs that when I was reading them, I had the interest of saying it, but at the same time, more, more than anything else, I also wanted to finish reading in that occasion the book. And there had a lot of content, and they had a lot of things that needed to be kind of excluded from the whole message because something that tends to happen now we are speaking about the Haratirastra and the Haratirastra is basically someone who let's say is morally wrong because of that same reason or that very reason it is that some things do not really so to speak have any real interest for um, or any any positive side to them They are only there to portray how evil and even more how, how of a negative figure, um, let's say, the Haratirastra can become. And he had a conversation with, it, I think it was his um, counselor or something like that, who ended up providing for him a logical way in which it was okay to do the things that he did. And, well, yeah, in one hand, there were a lot of negative things mixed in the message itself. There were also other parts which did not have such a, let's say, heavy side to it. So yeah, let me now continue. Canto 141, 51, 40, Canto 151, because yeah, let's hope we can find something similar to that. Satugrija Parva continued. My Sampayana said, at this time, Vidura has sent another man he trusts, a pure soul, into the forest surrounding Baranavrata. This man sees the Pandavas making their way through the forest with their mother. He sees them trying to measure the depth of their river in a certain place, obviously waiting, wanting to form the deep the water to safety on the other side. Vidura knows well how deep the Vyodhana's hatred runs and how marvelous his agents are. He sends his trusted agent to the Pandavas to help them, and this man now brings the sons of Pandu to a boat tethered to the riverbank. An, an extraordinary craft with engines and sails made by the finest shipwrights, one that is proof against wave and wind, a boat that flies across any current as swiftly as a thought. And it, 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 this book should supposedly be very old. Is this kind of um, okay? I always have a, a sense of problem because I never completely take these things as um, let's say. Well, okay. I mean, even if it were to be true, this is still an old book or a story that is based on an older time of humanity. How it is that they had, let's say, um, engines and sails in a boat? I. I am not a, somebody who is acknowledged about boats and all of that, that is why in this case I find it interesting to, to see and to analyze and to properly think about it, as if it were more than anything else, something that really might as well have not that sense of a premonition, but more like the possibility of containing um, a revelation or something like that, I don't know. continuing. <coughs> 
The man knows says to the Pandavas, Oh, Yudhishthira, listen to what I have to say, so that you know that I am indeed sent by your uncle Vidura. The wise man protects himself with the knowledge that neither the consumer of straw nor the dryer of the worms those that live in a hole in the head of a sunbury. These are the very words Vidura said to you, and by this know that I am his trust man and his agent. Vidura, who knows all things, says to you, Kuntiputra, he will one day surely prevail over Karma, Duryodhana and his brothers, and the evil Shakuni in battle. My boat is ready to bear you away, far from these places of danger. It is a marvelous boat and goes softly and smoothly over the river. Then, seeing Kunti and her sons, the handsome and forlorn, the tall man goes on the boat with them himself. He says again to them, Vidura, who has lifted your heads in love and embraced you fondly, says that you must never okay, says that you must be ever vigilant, for the peril to your lives is very real. With that, he takes the Narapungavas and their gracious mother across the Ganga. He helps them ashore there and softly cries, Kaya, then he leaves them. That good man was yet so mysterious and melts back to wherever he came from. <clears throat> the Pandavas send a secret message to him back to Vidura and then enter the great jungle that lies ahead of them on the far shore of the sacred river. They go quickly and stealthily. <laughs> Canto 152. By Sampayana said, When day breaks, a great crowd of those people converge at the house of Iyad. When they have put out the last flames, the city device has indeed been pulled with him to lacquer. They find the course of Kurochan. The people begin to wail loudly. It is certain that Duryodhana had this treacherous palace pulled to murder the sons of Pandu. Surely his father knew of the blood and had to side in it, or he would have prevented this dire crime. There is little doubt that even Shantanu Sol, Bhishma, Drona, Vidura, Kripa, and the other Kaudavas did not follow Dharma by saying the Pandavas here to die. Let us send word to the Harapidastra saying, You have achieved your heart's great desire. You have emulated the noble sons of your brother Pandu in the house of Iyak. They fetch water and put out the embers that the symbol and begin to search for the bodies of Kunti and her sons. They find charred courses of the poor Nishada woman and her five sons. Vidura's miner, the tunneler, goes with the people and cunningly covers them out of the underground passage, which he has dug with debris and ashes, so that no one discovers it. The people of Baranavrata send a message to the Hanatinastra that the Pandavas, Kunti and Burachana, have perished in the fire in the palace. The Hanatinastra hears the message and begins to sob loudly. He says, Today my magnificent brother has died in the persons of his wife and sons. Oh, go at once to Varanavarata and perform the funeral rites for the daughter of Kuntiraja and her great Shatriya sons. Sanctify the bones of the dead into the proper rituals and give alms and do everything that is proper and sacred at such a great occasion. Let all the relatives and friends of the dead go to Kasi, let no expense be spared so that their spirits find peace. Surrounded by his kinsmen, Ambika's son, the Haratirastra, offers Tarpana for his nephews. The Kurus weep, crying out the names of the princess whom they believe dead. Some cry, Ah, Yudhishthira, Yubaraja, you have left us. Others of, Oh, magnificent Bhima. Yet others cry, Falguna, you have gone and the earth is dim. Ah, the twin sons of the Azuins, Nakula and Sahadeva, the young ones, handsome as devas. Oh, Kunti, you have also gone. Thus they lament and offer Tarpana, oblations of water to allay the tears of the dead on their final journey. The people weep as well, only Vidura seems strangely composed. So he does shed some tears to show that he grieves, but then he knows that the Pandavas are not there. <laughs> Meanwhile, Kunti and the Pandavas cross the Ganga swiftly, 
Kill by the strength of the Boatman's sinews, the river's rapid current, and a timely wind that favors them. Leaving the boat, they go south, making their way through the moonless night by the light of the stars that fill the sky. They enter the abandoned shelter. They are overcome by exhaustion and thirst. They can hardly keep their eyes open, for the sleep comes strongly over them. Yet his spirit wants to be my in some despair. My brother, this is terrible. You are in the deep jungle and cannot tell which way to turn. And fatigue numbs us. Ah, are we certain that the vile Puruchana is dead? How shall we ever be safe again? The danger is still near us, my brother. Baharata, you're the only one among us that is not tired. For you are as strong and swift as the wine. Take us up again, Vima, and fly through the forest. The mighty Vima Sena picks up Pumji and his brothers again, and once more speeds through the trees. Ah, don't go and cut it up with three. She told me to cut it up Ah, my son Payana said, as the tremendous Vima hurls along. The entire forest seems to tremble at his footfalls. The trees that strike or brush his great chest shake and sway. He starts charming the air raids, a wind like the ones that blow to the boats of Yeshta and Ashadha. <laughs> Bima brings trees that stand in his path, crashing down and trample them. Rending the creepers and vines which clung to their branches, crushing their flowers and fluid, he goes through the jungle like the king bull of a great elephant hair. A must mother hungry does kind of sixty million in his prime and in root, when the icor bars forth from his temples and triples down his body. Indeed, so vigorously those Bima as swift as Garuda or Bali. Go that his brothers soon at his speed. Often he plunges headlong and easily across the deck. Deep and swirling streams and rivers, difficult to cross. The Pandavas have cast away their royal finery and disguised themselves as hunters for fear of the wicked spies of the sons of Dharatirashtra. Bhima now carries his delicate mother among his shoulders across the undulating banks of the river. O oh, Bharatare Shakta. Towards evening, still carrying his mother, and now also his brothers, Bima rides in a dreadful jungle, where there seems to be no food, druid, or even water, and where the cries of the beasts and beasts are eerie and threatening. As twilight grows into night, these cries and roars grow fearsome and more ominous. Soon the darkness is complete, and a howling gale blows out of nowhere. Felling trees, big or small, in its path like straws, exhausted with young measure and with the rising tears having its way with them, the princess collapse onto the jungle floor. They sit there panting, parts and also not having it. Kunti, who cannot bear her searing tears anymore, cries weakly. I am the mother of my Pandavas. And I am with all five of them, yet are worn with tears again and again, as if demented, she repeats this. Bima cannot bear it. <laughs> Springing up, picking up his brother's mother again, he charges once more to the fearful jungle, out of love for them, in quest of water. No living soul does he see anywhere. Indeed, the few beasts which sneak away through the undergrowth and vanish, and sorry, and vanish. Until suddenly he arrives in a clearing and sees before him a great and beautiful pipal tree with spreading branches. Gently he sets his family down in the tree, Maharatri Shabda, and says softly to them, "Rest while I go to search for water." I hear the sweet cries of water birds, not far from here. There must be a lake or at least a large pool at hand. If his tira whispers through arid leaves, it will go. Bima runs towards the green skulking of the waterfall. 
and soon enough comes upon a loping lake into which he plunges, bathing as lacking his tails. Quickly then he soaks his upper cloth with water and spits back to cool at his brothers, half a Johanna way. Tenderly he squeezes the precious life giving water to their lips, they decide to drink it and then sleep again. Viva sits in vigil over them, his scooty soon, where she sits in wilted. I seized my terrible grief. Vima begins to sigh like a snake. His gaze rose over his real mother and brought us asleep on the ground in the midst of this wilderness and tears stripping down the mighty Brikotara's great face. Ah, uh, miserable courage, I am that I have to see this sight today of my mother and my brothers asleep on bare forest ground. What can be more painful than this? In Hastinapura and even Varanavrata, they slept on the softest, ghostliest beds of down. I am a sinner that today my eyes see Kunti, as a sister, daughter of the formidable Kuntiraja, she who wears every species mark upon her real person, the daughter in Dana of Chitraviria, wife of the incomparable Pandu, mother of the five Pandavas, she who is radiant as the filaments of a lotus, as tender and delicate, her body only fit to sleep on the softest bed. But today, that Kunti lies on rough earth. She who has borne the sons of Dharma, Indra and Vayu, who has always slept in palaces, now lies exhausted, in a swoon on the ground under a tree. Ah, what more terrible sight shall my eyes ever see than this Urushabhyanakras, my noble brothers, asleep beside her mother, with Kishtira Dharmaputra, who deserves to have sovereignty over the two worlds, lies on the great ground. Arakuna, his skinned hue of thunderheads, who has no equal among men, lies like any common man on the ground. Oh, what can be more painful than this? And the young things, handsome as their sires, the Aswans, also lie like ordinary men upon rough earth. Truly, truly, he that has no envious, every kinsman lives in this world like a long tree in a village. Happily, the tree that stands alone in the village, fruit and leaves, is worshipped by everyone. Yet, there are those that have noble and righteous kinsmen and live joyfully in their midst, depending on one another, giving each other strength and support. These grow day by day in prosperity and strength, like great trees growing together in the stand in Sarvashan. What does for us were vanished by Tivel Dharatirastra and his murderous sons and narrowly escaped death by fire. Now here we are, under this tree in the heart of a forest, after everything we have suffered, where do we go next? Ah, you will cousins, and enjoy your success, for it will be short-lived. For now they will certainly favor you, but I swear you will still live only because yet Histira does not tell me to have done with you. Otherwise, Duryodhana, I will already have sent you to Yamaloka, with your brothers, your sons, and your friends, with Karnan Shakuni. But I am helpless. Because my elder brother is a man of such dharma that his rage has not yet been roused. Full of grief and wrath, Vima cleanses his great face and sighs. Brigodara looks at his sleeping mother and brothers again, and his fury flames up like a fire red with ghee. Then, calming himself with an effort, he says, There is sure to be some town not far from here. Let them awake and we will slake our tears together and be refreshed. Afterwards, we can consider what to do next. Until then, I must stay awake and watch over them. Vima sits in vigil over his sleeping family. Okay, very fine, very fine. 
Where is Ulag? I am worried about it. But I am going to think that. Yeah. So far, as long as we don't have a real disconnection, I am not going to really worry about it. Let me give me drink some water and we are going to continue with. Canto 154. Kidin Babada. No. Kidin Babada. Okay. Kidin Babada. Parma. There it is. Let me, let me, no, for real, let me drink water. Ah, there it is, water. Beautiful. Now, <coughs> as I was saying, let me not uh, Wait, I can fucking close this. Uh, what the is. Um, <coughs> my Sampayana continued. Not far from the place where the Pandavas sleep in a Rakshasa called Hidimba. Ah, okay. Sleep is a Rakshasa called Hidimba who lives in a lofty cellar tree. Feral and her ugly. His fangs are as long and sharp as daggers. Hidimba is hungry. He is filled with a yearning today to feast on some human flesh. Long are his legs, great and distended his belly and his wild hair and there are red. Hello, hello, you go, welcome, welcome. Um, we are uh, once again with this beautiful book. So, <laughs> how, how is your anymore? I hope you can have a good stay. You can enjoy whatever it is that we are doing here. Um, yeah, uh, a note, we are having some love, so if you see that this goes down, you will already know why. Um, well, that, that's it, I think. Welcome, I hope you have a great day. I will take time soon and we're going to continue with this meal. His shoulders are as white as three balls, his ears are pointed like arrows, altogether his face is savage and dreadful. Waking from a slumber in his branch, casting his crimson eyes around, the ravenous hidden basis, the sons of Pandu, sleeping in the jungle some way off. He shakes his horrid hair, scratches his tangled hair with his talons pointing up, yawns, look at the pandavas, looks away and back again at them. His skin is as dark as thunderclouds, he is quite enormous, and his body gives off a dull sheen. More than any other meat, Hidimba loves human flesh. He dilates his nostrils and sniffs the delectable scent upon the air of the sons of Pandu. He turns to his sister Hidimbi and says languidly, Ah, so long since I smelled sweet human meat, my mouth's watering. How long it is since I sank my eight fangs into the finest flesh of all? What can much? Sinking my fangs into a human throat and drinking the blood as it spreads fresh, frothy human blood. And it seems that today I will drink to my heart's content. Go and see my sister, who are these humans are. Oh, the scent of them invades me, it conquers me. Go, hidden be, kill all of them and bring them here. Tierra sleep in my jungle in Hidimba Bana. Have no fear but go quickly. Do what I say and we shall feast on them. Tearing the meat from their bones as we please. And my sweet sister, when we have had our fill, we shall dance together to very songs. Baharatere Shabha, Hidimbi, the Rakshasi, flies to where the Pandavas are, under the tall and graceful people tree. Arriving near them, she sees four pandavas, sound sleep under the yogaratha. She sees Kunti also sleeping beside her sons, and then her eyes fall upon the mighty Bhima, awake and be keeping watch over his family. He then visits Bhima, rude and handsome, like a salad tree himself, full of raw vigor, and she falls immediately and hopelessly in love with him. The Rakshas decides, she tells herself, Oh, look at him, his skin like molten gold, his arrows like the branches, his shoulders like a lion's, his throat marked with three auspicious lines like a corn shell, his eyes like lotus petals, and altogether splendid. I want him for my husband. 
I will not kill him as he did but once. A woman's love for her husband is stronger than her fondness for her brother. If I do kill him, Hidimba and I will enjoy him briefly, momentarily, but if I marry him instead, I can enjoy him forever. The Rakshasi can assume any form she wishes, and now she turns herself into a stunning woman, okay, into a stunning human beauty, and walks slowly towards Bima Mahabaho. She wears worldly ornaments, a smile on her full lips. Her guide is modest and she comes up to him and says, Who are you, Narabungaba? And how did you come here? Who are these warriors of heavenly beauty that sleep beneath the tree? Who, seamless, is this woman? Her loveliness also merely, who sleeps here in this jungle as trustfully as she might in her own bedchamber? Do you not know that this jungle belongs to a terrible Rakshasa whose name is Hidimba? He is my brother and he sent me to kill you for his meal. But then I saw you, magnificent as Kapeba, and I knew that I would have no one else for my husband. I love you, Manaba. You surely know Dharma. Know that I have given my heart to you. Do as you see fit. Oh, Kamasaros have pierced my heart and my body. I want you for myself. I beg you, make me yours. Mahabaho, I will rescue you from my brother. Anaha, no, Anaka, only become my husband. We will fly far from here and lay together upon the breasts of great mountains where no ordinary men ever set foot. For I can fly through the sky at will, mighty one. You will enjoy me in those sacred realms. I will give you great joy and pleasure. Bima replies, Rakshashi, perhaps a Muni, who has all his passions control and no attachments or whatever, could abandon his sleeping mother and brothers. But I certainly cannot go with, with you to satisfy my desire, leaving my brothers and my mother as food for a Rakshasa. He maybe says, then make them up and I will bear you all away from danger. But Mima says, Rakshasi, I am not afraid of your mind, brother, that I will awaken my family that sleeps so peacefully under the tree. Timid one, no Rakshasa has ever resisted the strength of these arms. Beautiful eyes, no Manava and Karma or Yaksha can withstand my might. Sweet one, ah, your form is so fine. Stay or leave as you please, or even send your brother here. I do not care. What a fucking amazing guy. Uh, Finally, a good uh, representation. <laughs> and let's continue. Canto 155. Hidimba Badha, Papa continue. My Sampayana said, Hidimba Rakshasa finds that his sister has not returned. He clambers down from his tree and stalks towards where the pandas lie asleep. His eyes are red, his arms powerful, the wiry hair on his head it sticks out, his slavering mouth hangs open, his body is like a mass of dark clouds, his fangs are like great needles, and he is a terrifying child. He then her, sees her brother came down from his sanity. She she is the anger of his face and trembles. She says to Bima, My evil brother comes in Morat. I beg you, waking your brothers and mother. And you must fly. I am as strong as any Rakshasa. Oh, fearless. And I can go wherever I like. Climb onto my back and I will carry all of you away from here. Parantapa, wake them up quickly and let us fly. Bima says, Oh, fair hips, fear nothing. As long as I am here, no Rakshasa can come. Any of us is lender waste. I will kill your brother in front of you. I tell you this scorch of the jungle is no match for me. Why? Not all the rakshasas of this world together can stand the strength of these arms. Look at my arms, sweet one, each is like an elephant's trunk. Look at my thighs, like iron maces. Look at my chest, how white it is, and hard like adamant, my beautiful one. Today you shall see my strength like Indra's fairy hips. Do not imagine that I am just an ordinary man. I beg you to not look upon my with contempt of this lie. He then says, Kurushaviyaragra, who are you? As handsome as a river, I have no contempt of this life for you, but only love. 
Va a dejar sin cuatro rechazas tú, tu mano nada más. Como el Stronger te yarta, man. Maharata, no te quedes closer. Quiero invadir esta conversación. Que si es que si esta has asumed a human form. Her hair woven with jasmine garlands. Her face like the full moon. Her nose, her eyes and brows. Exquisite. Her complexion fair and her skin soft. Her nails of lovely hue. Her ornaments beautiful. And wearing a flowing diaphanous robe. The Rakshasa suspects at once that she desires the human. With his eyes blaze, the laden at his sisters, he will arouse at him. When I am so hungry, what witless creature dares keep me from eating? Have you lost your mind? He will be that you do not feel my hunger? Fie on you, disloyal Rakshasi. Your flesh will last and do not think twice about hurting me. Why, your rabbit will sonor or very race and all your ancestors. I will kill you, rich woman, and all these that are with you. Ice smoldering, fang grinding against fang, Kidimba runs roaring at his sister to have done with her. But great Bima jumps up in his way and cries, Stop! Bima smiles contemptuously at the Rakshasa. He says to him, Hirimba, why do you want to make my brothers and border, who sleep so peacefully? Evil one, you should not kill a woman, especially one that has not seen. Rakshasa, fight me furious. This young woman has not seen that she desires me. For it is Kamadeva, the god of love, who inflames her as he does all the living. Wretch, your sister came here at your command. She saw me and lost after me. What harm has she done to you by desiring me? It is Kama that offends you, Rakshasa, and you will not hurt her while I am here. You will not kill a woman. Come, let us go some way off and fight. For vilest of Rakshasas, today, I mean to send you to Yamaloka. Rakshasa, I will crunch your head today as if an elephant stamped it. When I have killed you, herons, shackles and kites will gleefully tear the flesh from your limbs and feast on your carcass. For too long you have ruled this under with terrors, and it shall be rid of you in a few moments, Hidimba. You are as big as a hill, but your sister will soon see you being dragged about like a fallen elephant by a great lion. Vilest of Rakshasas, when I have killed you, men shall pass in safety to this Bana again, and without fear, Hidimba replies, Manaba, great and boast indeed, but do what you say, you will, and then perhaps you might surely boast. Come, let us not waste a moment. You are strong indeed, but today test your strength against me. I swear that I will not kill your brothers, and I, I have killed you. Till then, let them sleep in peace. But when I have killed you, O oh, fool of Andrahart, I will drink your blood and then kill your family. Finally, my sister, as well, for she has betrayed me. Hidimba stretches out his huge arms and rushes at Bima Parantaba. In a flash, almost playfully, the evil Bima Sena seizes the Rakshasa's arms, roughly as easily as a lion might some small creature of the jungle. The Pandava attracts Hidimba, some crosses from that place where his brothers and mother sleep. Outrage and rage startle to feel the strength of the human. The Rakshasa gives an earth shaking roar. Bima drags him far there. Away, lest his robots and curses awaken Kunji and his brothers. Now they lock together, the Manava and the Rakshasa, and fight like two grown tuskers mad with rage. They uproot the trees that grow around them and strip each other with their trunks. Such a noise do they make that the other Pandavas and Kunji awake and see Hidimbi sitting before them, disconsolately. This is a uh, wait, wait, wait. They uproot the trees that grow around them and strike each other with their trunks. This is literally the meme of uh, how men fight and both are hitting each other the most crude of the ways. <laughs> that this is literally that. Basically. <laughs> Basically. <laughs> Let me, let, me, let me continue. 
Pero bueno. Canto un canto de fructicidad. Hidimba Barja, Barba continua. Mais en Payana continua. Waking and Sinta Extraordinary Beauty of Hidimba Barja. Kunti and Kersons are full of wonder. Kunti speaks to her sweetly. Who are you that are as beautiful and radiant as a child of the universe? Who the one whose daughter are you? Where have you come from? If you are the baby of this banner or an Apsara, tell me about yourselves and why you are here. Kidimbi replies, This great champion of the color of a blue cloud is the domain of a Rakshasa called Hidimba, most beautiful and gracious lady. I am his sister and he, oh blessed one, send me to kill you and your souls. But when I arrived here I saw your mighty son who sat awake, gracious lady. Kama, who pervades the nature of all the living, struck me with his flowery arrows, and I fell in love with your red soul and chose him in my heart for my husband. I told your soul that I will carry all of you away from this place, but he would not allow me. When I did not return to Kidimba, my brother came here and your soul hauled him away. Now they fight, the Manavanta Rakshasa, both of them endowed with untold strength and make the vana tremble with her dreadful roars and blows. Yet he still shoves up as the Arjuna and Akula and the husband Sahadeva, and they see that Bhima and the Rakshasa do indeed fight some way off, like two lions. The dust the rise with their flying heavy feet seems like the smoke from a forest fire, covered by the dust. Their massive bodies are like two cliffs shrouded in mist. Arjuna sees Bhima and it Beleaguered by Hidimba. For the Bayuputra has not rested at all. With a smile, Arjuna says to his brother, You are tired, Bimo. Let Nakula and Sakadeva watch over our mother. You must rest. I am here now. I will kill the Rakshasa. Bimo retorts, Look upon this fight as a spectator, Arjuna, for he has come within the reach of my hands and who will not escape with his life. Arjuna replies, Then why, O oh Bima, do you let him live so long? Parantapa, we must be on our way. He will become stronger with all, as his kind always do during the trees and fires. He will also use his Maya Shakti then. Do not toy with him any longer, but use all your strength now and kill him, my brother. Blessing up, Bima summons the awesome strength that his father Bayu employs during the Paralaya. With a roar, he seizes Hidimba and lifts him easily into the air. He spins the Rakshasa's great body, blue as thunderheads around, a hundred times in a moment. Bima says, Rakshasa, you are blessed with intelligence in vain. You have fed for too long on unsanctified meat. You deserve an unholy death. I will rid this man of you today and make it a shangle without thorns. No more, Hidimba will feast on human flesh. Arjuna says again, impatiently, Bima, if you're finding it difficult to kill the Rakshasa, let me help you. Kill him quickly or let me do it. You're tired and must rest. Bima flings Hidimba Rakshasa down savagely onto the ground. He plants his foot on the Rakshasa's back and breaks his body in two, like some twig. Hidimba lets, lets out a dying cry that echoes through that banner, deep as the sound of a wet drum. His brothers crowd around Bima, a slayer of all his enemies, and embrace him. Then Arjuna says, Gesta, I believe there is a town not far from this banner. Let us go and hide there, so do not have a spice, do not find us here. His brothers, those Maharatas, those tiger among men, agree, so be it. They set out with Kunti and Hidimbi, the Rakshasi, following them. I, I love this, by the way. It is amazing to see uh, the way in which this story falls sometimes. It is uh, completely almost... Uh, yeah, it, it feels very like a... You know, a, a grandiose story of... I, I think... The, let me say it like this. I was going to say, it feels like another story that comes from uh, other media, but in reality, it's obviously one of the oldest stories in that sense. So it is more like... When people see stories like this being told in the past, they cannot avoid but want to replicate it, let's say. I, I guess, I, I will guess. And yeah, I can't, I can't probably convey what it is that it happens, but anyway, let's continue. Canto 157. Hidimba Hadva Parva continued. 
Mai sunt pe Iana Seve. Bima se schidim mi follow un tem, Antons on care with soft brawl. E, he says, Raxosas avenge themselves on their enemies with impenetrable deception. So, he didn't be, he must also go after your brother. He will have killed her, but yet he still intervenes. Bima, Purusha Biarra. However, angry you are, you must never kill a woman. Pandava, Dharma is more important than protecting one's life. You have killed Hidimba who came to kill us. This woman is surely his sister. But what harm can she do us even if she wants to? <coughs> but who, who? Who was it that uh, Bima? Okay. Isn't Bima the one who knows that she's infatuated with him? Uh, anyways, Hidimbi folds her hands before Kunti and Yudhishthira as well. She says, Gracious lady, you know the pang. The pangs that Kama bikes a woman feel. Ah, the punks! Okay, okay, okay. Gracious lady, you know the punks that Kama makes a woman feel. He torments me now with them, with love for your son, Bimasena. I live only for the moment when your son will suit the fever that consumes me. The time has come, sweet lady, and I hope that he will make me glad. I abandon my brother and my people, only to have Bimasena for my husband. Most illustrious lady, if you will not have me, I will kill myself. Fair one, the gracious, beautiful one, be merciful to me. Think of me as being either a fool or your slave, but let your son Bima, handsome as ever, marry me now and let me take him with me, where I go, where I will. <coughs> Noble lady, trust me, I will bring him safely back to you. Also, think of me at any time and I will come to you immediately and take you wherever you wish to go. I will protect you from every danger and carry you over the most inaccessible and remote places upon my back through the sky. Ah, be merciful and tell your son to make me his wife. The races have said that in times of peril, one should protect one's life from your enemies at all without considering scrapples. Yet, he that keeps the Dharma in times of endurance and trial is the best of men. For the stress is the greatest threat to men of Dharma. Dharma protects life, indeed. Dharma is called the giver of life. Thus, nothing one does to keep Dharma and say one's life can be changed. I am the means to your safety. Tell your son to make me his. But his tyranno says, he didn't be, you speak truly, but the slender wasted one, you must keep your word. After his morning ablutions, his prayer and all rituals, be much of yours during the days, until the sun sets. Enjoy the days with him as you please and wherever you like. But he didn't be, who can play as swiftly as the man, you must bring him back to us at nightfall of every day. Bima bows his head to what Yudhishthira says, for he does indeed desire Hidimbi, he says, still moisted Rakshashi, I promise to remain with you and to be yours until you have a soul. Soulfully, Hidimbi cries, so be it! She then picks Bima up effortlessly, rises up into the sky with him and flashes away. She flies with him to lofty mountains, sacred to the devas of unearthly beauty, who are nameless and rare beasts, seen as they do nowhere else in the world. Among their peaks, on the sides where magnificent trees grow, great sires of their kind, and in their secret valleys, Kirimbi makes love with Bima all day long. She assumes the most beautiful form for him, whereas ornaments pass compare and often breaks into fine songs herself, singing more sweetly than the birds. They take their deep pleasure of each other in the hearts of impenetrable forests, beside lakes like great jewels upon the earth, fragrant and laden with lotus and lily on exquisite lands that stand in the flow of great rivers. On soft sands and smooth pebbles in caves hidden behind towering waterfalls upon the sylvan Himalaya in crestering pools at the feet of their these cascades upon which also resplendent lotuses shine on seashores in great and empty beaches where no man has ever set foot where gold dust and nuggets sparkle in pearls shine like small moons in great towns and cities, in sprawling gardens, in sacred tapobanas, upon myriad hills, in the hidden domains of the Uyakas and Sidhas, on the banks of the Mana Manasarobaja, where flowers and fruit festoon the radiant giant trees perennially.
Indeed, he can even fly swiftly as divine as she makes love with Bima in all these places until she becomes pregnant and in her time delivers a mighty son. His eyes are fierce, his mouth wide, his ears long and pointed like arrows, he is altogether ferocious to behold. His lips are coppery, his teeth sharp fangs, his arms great, his strength greater, and the child quickly becomes a master archer. His nose is long and sharp, his chest wet as couches, his calves are tremendous, his swiftness incredible, but, and there is nothing human about his face or appearance though he is indeed the son of a man. As soon as that child is born, within an hour he grows into a lord. He is stronger than any Bisasha of any tribe and any Rakshasa who, quickly taught by his great uncles, he becomes a master of every weapon. Rakshasa woman give birth to the very day they conceived. It is an ancient blessing given to them by the very Durga, so they do not have to forego sexual pleasure for any length of time. Of course, they can assume many forms they shows, terrible or beautiful. The man heading the son has no hair on his head. When he is born, he bent to touch the feet of his mother and his father. He then be remarks that his head is as smooth as a gacha, a water pot, and his parents name him Gato Gacha, the pot headed. <laughs> Why? <laughs> what? <laughs> Anyways, Gato Gacha is devoted to his father and his uncles, and he is soon their favorite, but now he didn't know that her time with Bima has come to an end. She takes sad leave of them and goes away, to range the world as she pleases. Gatot Kacha, greatest among Rakshasas, takes their blessing as well, and promising to appear before them whenever they leave him and summon him with a thought, also leaves them and shorn is not. It is told that Indra gives an arms of himself to create Maharata Gatot Kacha. His reason for this is to create a worthy adversary for Karma, sadly one that he could finally kill with a deadly Shakti, inexorable weapon, which Indra himself gives to that matchless warrior. Okay, eh, uh, second because I, I, I don't need to go up to the bathroom. <sighs> yeah, I haven't, oh, fuck. I haven't called myself back uh, for the longest time. Ah, give me a second. Pim 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 pim
uh, minimally similar to this one, I will say it has a very very shonen vibe, it's a, so it is uh, very nice to continue this particular story. Yeah. I, I wanted to say I am probably going to continue as long as I don't feel my heart hurt, basically. Heart, 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 basically. So yeah, and we are going to see how much I can go. <laughs> I, I don't really know. Um, so far, I, I think, yeah, I think in a sense it, it really made me excited because the story finally got fucking interesting and yeah, after uh, what was it? The, the whole side of having to read and having to see. Oh yeah, because they want to build that and they want to build this and and. It was the part itself. It is not that we were talking about somebody killing or somebody else. It is we were going over something that we already knew happened because we got the short version and somehow I because um, the one who was talking to by Sampayana, I think it is Kanamehaya, decided to fucking ask why, why, what happened in detail. We had to endure this whole story once again when we already got the details of what happened. So yeah, let us, let us finally keep proceeding with something that is uh, finally fresh. And I, I hope, mm, yeah, I noticed that it really kind of makes me angry, so I hope this doesn't apply to other things, you know? I hope it doesn't uh, happen with, I don't know. I, I think the best example in this case would be the Bajar Barita, because I, I want to read that in particular, so yeah. Let me, let me see. <coughs> Canto 188. In Barbarja, Barba continued. My Sampayana said, The Pandama Maharatas wander from the jungle to the jungle, hunting deer and other animals for their food. Their travels take them through the kingdoms and lands of the Matrias, the Priartas, the Panjaras, and the Kichakas, with their emerald forest shivered with lakes like the faces of the purest diamonds. The brothers all were their hair in mated Haya and Balkala for Darians or animal hides. Those redoubtable Kshatriyas were the guard of wandering Sanyasis and Kunji goes with them, their mother. <coughs> At times, the Maharatas carry hair upon their back and hurry, hurry along their way when they fear that they might be discovered. They go in disguise across the worlds, wild places, the study the Rick and the other Vedas, as well as the Vedangas and other Shastras that deal with Dharma and politics too. During their wandering, they meet their grandsire Krishna Doivayana, the Maharishi Vyasa, they, <coughs> they prostrate at his feet, then stand before him with folded hands, the Pandavas and Kunti. Vyasa says, Maharata Rishabhas, I know everything that has happened. Indeed, I had foreknowledge of it during my dhyana. I have come to bless you and to tell you that all that has transpired, your suffering and exile, will finally turn out for the best, and you will benefit from it. Do not grieve over any of this. It is all for your final happiness. It is true that the Haratikastra souls and you are all the same to me, yet I must be partial to those that have suffered during their tender years, so certainly my affection for you is no greater. And because of that love, I want to bless you and to do some great good to you. Not far from this place is a fine little town, where you will be perfectly safe. Take yourselves there, disguise, and wait for me to come to you again. Satyavati son Doipayana comforts the sons of Pandu and leads them the township of Eka Chakra. The mummy also concerns Kunti, the long daughter of the Lord Son Yudhishthira, devoted as he is to truth, this radiant Purushire Shabha, who has conquered the world with his dharma, will soon rule over all the rulers of the earth and be a king of kings. Arjuna and Bhima will subdue the world in their brother's name, the earth with her girdle of seas, and with his tira, will rule as emperor, your sons and madres maharatas, as well, will enjoy all power and every luxury and pleasure. <laughs> These Purush Vyaharas will perform many great sacrifices, including the imperials Rahasuya Yagna and the Asmumarha Yagna, 
and munificent shall be the gifts they bestow upon the Brahmanas of the world. Your sons will one day also rule over the kingdom of their ancestors, the Guru kingdom, and they will keep their friends and kinsmen in great comfort, wealth and joy. Vyasa brings them into the home of Brahmana in Akashakra. Then the Iceland born raises his to his tira. Be here and wait for my return. Adapt yourself to the place and your situation, and I, Vyasa, say to you that happiness waits for you around the corner of the place. The Pandavas fold their hands humbly to him and say, So be it. The Inumin Toipayana then leaves them and returns to his Asarama, from where he has come. Canto 159, Bhakavadha Parva, King Hanamehayas, Divi, 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 okay, Divi Jotama, best of Brahmanas, what did those mighty Maharatas, those Kuntiputras, do in Ekachakra? My Sampayana said, they live for a time in the home of a Brahmana, disguise themselves as Brahmanas do. But during the day, they go begging for alms and return a task with whatever they have received and give it all to Kunti, who divides the alms in two equal portions. Bima eats one portion while the other is shared by Kunti and Karotar sons. They range far, the sons of Pandu wander into enchanting forests, past crystalline lakes and frothing, clean rivers, and they become the great favorites with the people of the Kachakra for the manner in which they deport themselves. Thus, O Bharati Rishabha, some time passes. One day, while four of her, four of her sons are out being arms, Nima is in the room in the home of the Brahmana, their host with his mother Brita. Suddenly, Kunti hears piteous souls echoing from within the Brahmana's house. She hears the man, his wife and children all crying in the most heartbroken manner. Kunti cannot meet it and says to Bima, My son, you are living peacefully and happy in the house of this Brahmana, who shows us such kindness and respect. Your Yaskana has no idea where we are, but it is us to be dead. My child, I am always blessing this Brahmana in my heart and wondering what a great good I should do to him. The two man by Bima always pays back more than he receives. Some terrible tragedy has overtaken our host. If we can be of any help at all to him. Yeah, yeah, uh, also. Thank you. Oh my god, I, I didn't see it. I, uh, thank you, thank you, thank you. I have thank a lot of time. Yes, yes. Yeah, I, I didn't know it, it took so long, but yes, uh, Maha, Maha Bharata time. They did say Maha Bharata or something like that. Amazing. He didn't even try to say it. Uh, incredible. <laughs> so yeah, uh, incredible. The, the, the AI said, "No, I am not pronouncing these words." Uh -huh, no, no. And that's it. <laughs> but well, welcome. Um, we are um, basically seeing a great tragedy happen and how they are going to solve it. Yeah. Let me let me see. If we can be of any help at him too. So what the fuck? If we can be of any help at all to him, we must require his generous hospitality. Bima says at once, Mother, find out what ails the Brahmana, whatever it might be. I will do everything I can to remove his distress, however difficult that might be. They hear more anguish cries from the Brahmana and his wife. Kunti rises and runs towards the inner chambers of the house of the host, even like a cow does to her tethered dog. She passes a floor and sees the Brahmana, his wife, their son and daughter are sitting in that most deception. With tears streaming down their faces, the Brahmana says, Oh, course this worldly life. It is as hollow as a reed, pointless, and founded just on sorrow. It begins and ends in grief and knows no freedom. Life is a disease, a tale of misery. The Atman is one, but it must pursue Dharma, Artha and Kama, and because it does so, and at the same time, this God arises, and then not all grief. Some say that Moksha is our final desire and goal, but I am certain that it can never be attained. The acquisition of wealth is hell, the pursuit of it attended by misery, and when one finally does acquire wealth, 
one is even more miserable for one has grown attached to one's hard earned possessions and lives in constant anxiety of losing them. And today, mortal danger has entered my life, and I cannot see how to escape it. Wife of mine, how often I told you, let, let us leave this town and go somewhere else where we should be happy. But you will not listen. You always replied, simply woman. I was born here and I have grown all here. This is my home, the place of my ancestors. But your mother and father left this world a long time ago. All your relatives are also there. Then why did you want to go on living in this wretched place? No, you think you will not listen to me. I know that terrible time has come for you to lose one member of your family. What would be more terrible for me? But no. It is I that will offer myself to that because I could never sacrifice any of you while keeping myself alive. You have been such a good wife to me. I helped me in any point that I undertook. Always self-effacing and always as loving as a mother. The gods gave you to me as a true companion and you are my mainstay, my greatest support. My parents got us married. Your language is as pure as your nature is sweet. You are the mother of my children, devoted, chaste, and innocent. I married you with every holy right and will not abandon you now, who have been so constant in your brother. I will not sacrifice your life to save mine. Ah, how will I sacrifice my son who has not yet attained poverty? How will I sacrifice my daughter, my own child, given to me my to me by God to become my mother one day of my grandchildren, through whom my ancestor and I will attain those realms that only a daughter's soul can bestow upon our souls? There are those that say that a father loves his own best, while others insist that a daughter is a father's favorite. But for me, both my children have always been equal and equally loved. It is plain that I cannot sacrifice the life of any of you. Yet, if I find myself, who will look after you when I am gone? What peace will my spirit have even in the next world? You will certainly perish as well without me. Oh, there is no cure for the horrible tragedy that has overtaken us. No escape. I do not know what to do. It seems the only course is for all of, for all four of us to go and die together. Yes, that seems the only way. What? Why it's so so tragic? What the fuck? I, I, I didn't even understand what why it is that they is. What happened? What? What is the reason? Also, I'm sorry. sorry. I think I didn't say it properly. Thank you. Thank you for the description. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you a lot. Obviously, it means a lot. Sorry for not saying it properly before. Thank you. And now, <laughs> continue. Canto 116. Bakabadja Parva continue. Bakasampayana continue. Hearing the Brahmana's strict words, his wife says, Oh, Brahmana, you must not grieve like an ordinary man. This is no time for lamenting. You are learned and you know that all who are born must surely die. You must not grieve over the inevitable. A man seeks a wife, a son or daughter, all for himself. You are a wise man. Kill your grief. I will go in your place, for it is the highest dharma of a woman to save her husband's life by sacrificing her own. I could hope for no greater fortune. By doing this, I will find joy and great fame in this world, and eternal bliss in the next. I tell you, my husband, this is a woman highest dharma, and by this we shall both find both punya and sukha. We have fulfilled my womanhood by beating your poor children. I owe you no further debt. When you are able, we can support and nurture that son and daughter, but not I. You are my life, my wealth, and my lord. Without you, how will I feed or care for these young ones? Why? How will I support myself? If I am a widow and without a lord, how will I keep the three of us alive and still lead a chance and honest life? If arrogant or otherwise unworthy sweeters come from your daughter's hand, how will I protect her? My lord, when the spirits fly hungry at this garden meat, so do men seek out a woman who has lost her husband. Brahmanatatama, my virtue might well falter if even men repeatedly importune me. 
Then, how will I be able to set this innocent daughter of yours upon the pure path which all her ancestors have walked? As for your son, how will I, as a widow, teach him everything that he should know, so that he becomes as accomplished and virtuous as yourself? Like sugars that demand to heal together. These men will come for your daughter's hand, and how will I resist them? Even if I refuse, they might well take her by force, like cross, still sacrificial gift. This pure child, blessed with all your qualities. And when the world sees your son become so unlike his father, and your daughter married to some low man, it will despise and dishonor him, even the world sees it. And when I will certainly die. And when the both of us are dead, these children will also perish like fish when they have no water in which to live. So, O oh, Brahman, you must allow me to sacrifice myself. Also, those that know Dharma always say that for a woman who has borrowed children to die before her husband is the greatest punya. Ah, I am more than ready to abandon my son and my daughter and my kin and life is safe for your sake. For a woman to serve her husband is her highest dharma, lofty than yagnas, brava sangyasa, or any kind of dana. So, what I mean to do is the purest dharma and punya for you and your mates. The Rishi say that a man treasures his wife, children, relatives, and all his possessions to save himself from danger and sorrow. He watches over his world to put danger away, and with this wealth he supports and protects his wife, and himself he protects through both his wealth and his wife. The sage truly say that a man acquires a wife, a son, wealth and a house in order to safeguard himself against any misfortune. As expected and unforeseen, the ancients have also declared that all one's relatives together are not equal to oneself. So, my lord, you must sacrifice me to save yourself. I beg you let me sacrifice myself so that you can care for these young ones of mine. Besides, those who know Dharma always say that a woman must never be killed. Rakshasas also know the laws of Dharma. It is certain that a Rakshasa will kill a man, but not so that he will dare kill a woman. This is another reason for you to send me to the Rakshasa. My lord, I have enjoyed great happiness, so much joy and pleasure, and I have also acquired a good deal of spiritual punya. I have borne you these two children who are so precious to me. And my womanly ones needs have been fulfilled, and I have lived a long life. I am not afraid to die. I am always eager to serve and pleasure you. That is my nurture. Keeping all of this in mind, I have arranged at my resolve. When I am gone, you can marry another wife, and through her find more religious merit. There is no sin in it. For a man to take a second wife is punya, while for a woman it is a sin to marry a second husband. Remember all this, my lord, and also that for you to sacrifice your life is sinful. And so, do not delay, but set us all free from our burden of grief, yourself, your family, and these children of ours. Baharata, the Brahmana embraces her emotionally, and tears stream down their faces, while grief and silence fill the room. If, if I finally understood correctly, uh, one of those uh, non-humans wants to kill them. Uh, this guy, correct? Yeah. Uh, let me see. Yeah, but we're we're not lying, right? Okay. I I don't know why my mind said lie, lie, lie. No worries. Count to one hundred sixty-one. Bhagavad Gita Parva continues. My sampayana continues. Listening to her parents, the daughter is stricken by cries. Why do you lament and cry like this, as if you have no one to care for you? Hear what I have to say, O oh, my father and mother, before deciding what you are going to do. It is not true that one day you will have to send me away, even to someone to be his wife, she must, since you must sacrifice me one day, let it be today, and so save three lives for the price of one. Men wish for children, believing that they will save everything in this world and the next. So, today, follow the river of your misfortunes by making a raft of me, your child. Say, the sages call a child a putra, a savior, because a child does indeed save its parents, both in this world and the next. The Peters wish for grandchildren from me, to become their special saviors. But by saving my father's life today, I will become a savior to them myself. My brother, 
these little ones, you know, and uh, there is no doubt that he will not survive if you die. If both my father and my brother perish, there will no one left to offer the pinda and the for the spirits of our names. Nothing will be more terrible. And if you both leave me, and my mother will certainly not survive your deaths. I will sink into the deepest despair and die myself a her broken death. However, if you, my mother and father, and this little one continue to live, our family will continue, and the ancestral pinda will also continue to be offered. Son is a man's very soul. His wife is his dearest friend. What a daughter is only a woman. Rid yourself of this world, and Father, and let me tread the high path of Dharma. I am a girl. If you die, I will become helpless, certainly come to grief, one way or another. That is why I have decided to save our clan and gain the beauty of this fearful sacrifice. Bibi Hotama, if you leave me and go to the Rakshasa yourself, I will never recover from the grief of it. Be merciful to me, Purushothama. For all our sakes, for the sake of Dharma and for our clan, I must sacrifice my life and live on. You must send me away one day soon. It is inevitable. Let peace be that day. What could be more terrible than if you are to die and we are forced to live on, begging for our food like dogs, at the mercy of any stranger who wants to take advantage of us? But if you live on, I will surely find great joy in the Baloka. I have heard that the man sacrifices his daughter, offering her like an obligation to the devas and the Peter. He and his shall find prosperity. Tears run ceaselessly down her face as she speaks, and her parents are plunged deeper into despair. The drift on her, one another on shop, sing them, the son of the house, the little innocent, say in the sweetest lisp, and his eyes wide and shining. Don't cry, my mother, my father, my sister. He goes up to them, smiling and brandishing a blade of grass in his small hand, screwing up his face into a delightful snarl. He cries, I will slay the Rakshasa and kill its people. At which the spider predicament and their terror, the other three was burst out laughing. Kunti sees her mom, moment and enters the room. She speaks to them and truly what she says revives their spirits as Amrita does a dying man. Holy fuck, God. Man. That. <laughs> you know. Ah, man. What a. Okay. The, the moment in which the, the kid entered the scene and it almost. It had the possibility of turning even uh, darker. And the fact that they, <laughs> let's say like this, they decided to not make it dark, feels amazing. I, I was, when the kid started to talk, and with such a uh, innocent idea, the portray himself, I, I literally was feeling the, the interest, or I, I don't know how to carry it. Tears, basically, fucking tears, my you know. Mm, it, it, is, it is fine, it is fine. Uh, it didn't happen so well. <laughs> Canto 162. Bhagavadha Parva Bhutiya. Kundi says, tell me the cause of your grief and I will remove it if I can. The Brahmana replies, Sangyasini, I thank you for your noble intention, but our grief cannot be removed by any human agency. Not far from our town, there lives a Rakshasa called Baka, and he is the lord and master of all these lands. He is inordinately strong and rules our country. He is also the lord of all the Rakshasas and thus he protects our town from the rest of them, and we fear no enemy at all. However, in return for his protection, we must send him a regular offering with a catload of rice, drawn by two buffaloes and the human that drives the cart. Every family store goes to send the Rakshasa at his offering. And there have been so many homes in our country, which once those comes after many years. If any household tries to escape their door when it comes, Baka descends on them and kills the entire family, men, women, and children, and eats them. The king of this country lives in a city called Metraquilla. He's a wanton and, and an imbecile, 
and does nothing to protect us, and continuing to live in the kingdom of such a weak and important monarch, we surely deserve our fate. No one can force our Hamorana to dwell permanently in any place, and they are like beasts that migrate from kingdom to kingdom in complete freedom. The races have always maintained that one must find one must first find a good king, then a good wife, and then seek wealth. Acquiring this dream, one becomes capable of saving oneself and one's clan. But I have been foolish in my pursuit of this dream, and today I find myself plunged in a sea of mortal danger and misery. For today, this mortal to send Bakashura his offering of food, which will destroy my family. I do not have the money with which I might buy a man willing to sell his life and take back his cargo of rice. I cannot think of sacrificing my wife or my children. I see no ray of hope or escape and I am sinking in the sea of dread. I have decided that the only course for us is to go all together to the monster and let him devour us all. Holy fuck it! <laughs> Why was this so drastic, my brother? Canto 160T, Bakabad Japar va continuar. Canti se hizo esta semana. No lo tuve de ninguna. God of Rahamana. For I have a way to save you from this Rakshasa. He has just one son, and besides, he is a young child, and only one daughter as well. Also, tender girl. I see no reason why either of them, your wife or even you, shall sacrifice yourselves to satisfy the Rakshasa. Rahamana, I have five sons. Let one. Let one of them take the cart of rice to Baka. But the Brahmana is aghast at the idea. I can never allow someone else to sacrifice his life for me. You are Brahmanas and my guest. Why? Even a low-born man will not accept your offer. It has always been said that one should sacrifice oneself and one's children for the sake of a Brahmana, but certainly not the reverse. I believe this, and if I have to choose between the death of Abrahamana and my own, I will always choose to die myself. Brahmahatya, it is the most heinous sin of all, and there is no expiation for it. It is better to sacrifice one's own life, however sadly, than Abrahamana's. Noble, blessed lady, I will not be committing suicide if I go to the Rakshasa, and no sin will cling to me in my next life. But if I countenance Abraham again his life for mine, I will sin grievously and will never escape the consequences. The reasons have said that abandoning or betraying someone who comes to your home for protection, as well as participating in the death of one that seeks death at your hands, are both dreadful sins. The sages say that. The sages say it is in the context of what is permissible in great danger and distress. So, dear lady, it is far better for me that I die with my wife and children today than that I sacrifice a Brahmana's life so that I can continue living. Good replies. Brahmana, I also believe firmly that a Brahmana should never be sacrificed. And as for me, even if I had a hundred sons instead of the fact that I do, none of them would be any less dear to me than the others. But the Rakshasa will not kill me with son. This cast, this son of mine, is released with the strength of your joy in my imagination. He is also a master of occult mantras. He will deliver the offering of food to the Rakshasa, but will escape with his life. It will not be the first time. Neither I have seen more than once my son killing the most powerful Rakshasas. Fiends big as he yokes, but Brahmana, he must not tell anyone this secret, for then those that want this secret power for themselves will never leave my sons in peace. The priests have said that if my son teaches his secret knowledge to anyone without his guru's leave, he himself will lose his strength. Hearing what Preta says, incredulous joy fills the Brahmana and his wife, for surely her words are like Amrita to them. Kunti takes the Brahmana to Vimasena by Aputra and tells him about the Rakshasa and what she wants him to do. Vietnam replies casually, as if, it is, as if this is nothing. So be it. What a, what a great narration. Let me see, let me see. Because how much we have been arresting? Uh, one hour and a half. Uh, is internet working properly? Yeah, it, it seems to be working properly. So, I am going to 
I want to do this. I'm going to. Con yeah, I don't think I feel sleepy yet, so we are going to probably go one or two more. On, what is it? One or two more Diram Cantos. Let, let's say. Or one. Uh, yeah, yeah. If I were to come to that, let me see. This one is two pages. Okay, two pages. That one. I can do it. Uh, two pages, I can do it. And if this one is also two pages, we are finishing this one. Yeah, yeah. We are, we are doing three more, at the very least. Uh, and after that, we are going to see if I can do even more. But yeah, yeah, so far, it shouldn't, it doesn't really seem or pose a problem to continue with this. So yeah, we should go. Oh, 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 oh. <sighs> Canto 164. Bacabar Hapar no continua. By Sampayan said, After Giva, Bima gives his word, O Baharata, saying, I will. The other Pandavas return with the alms and they have begged during the day. But Kishtira takes one look at Bima's delighted expression and guesses at what has transpired while he's out. But Kishtira sits beside his mother and says quietly, What task has Bima undertaken? Did you command him or did he take it upon himself? Kanti replies calmly, I told Bima Parantapa to do this great thing for the sake of the good Brahmana and to liberate this lovely township from fear. Yet he still says sharply, What rashness, mother! You do not know what you have done. This is like telling Bima to commit suicide. Say says, Never approve of abandoning one's child. Oh, my mother, why do you want to sacrifice your own soul to save another's life? This is not only natural for humans, but against everything. That the Veda teaches we sleep peacefully at night because of Bima's strength. We have some hope of recovering our kingdom from the envious souls of the Haratigastra because we rely on Bima's strength. Duryodhana and Shakuni do not sleep at night because the thought of Bima's strength haunts them. We escaped from the house of Iliak because of Bima's strength. Countless other perils he has saved us from. Bima killed Purochana because of him we have already think of ourselves as killing the Haratagastra souls and ruling the earth again very soon and over all the world that is in her. Mother, what were you thinking when you decided to sacrifice Bima to the Rakshasa today? Have you lost your reason, Kunti? Or have, have our recent trials clouded your mind? Give us a second. Uh, Kunti says, I have not lost my reason, neither is my mind clouded, yet he still and you need have no fear for Bima. You have been living safely in this Brahmana's house, and discovered by Duryodhana, and our host has shown us great respect and affection. We are in his debt, and gratitude is the mark of a noble man. Indeed, the true man returns more than he receives. And it is to repay your debt to the good Brahmana that decided to send Bima to the Rakshasa. I have now seen Bima's strength when we escaped from the house of Iyak when he killed Hidimba and I have complete faith in him. My son is as strong as 10,000 elephants. That is how he carried five of us, each one weighty as an elephant from Baranavrata. No one on earth is as strong as Bima. Why? I venture that he might well defeat Indra, who is the Baja and is the greatest warrior. Soon after he was born, he fell from my lap down onto the mountain below. The fall left no scratch on him, but the rock onto which he fell was shattered. Pandava, even then I knew my son's matchless strength. No, neither rashness nor foolishness made me decide to send Bima against the Rakshasa or any ulterior motive. Deliberately, and after careful thought, I decided to do this thing. Yet he did that. We shall repay your deep debt to our host by defeat as well as gain a great punya by it. A Shatriya who serves a Brahmana in any manner acquires many lofty lands of this in the hereafter. A Shatriya who saves a Brahmana's very life certainly finds great fame in this world and the next. A Shatriya who helps a Baisi and become very popular and a warrior must not hesitate to help even a Shudra comes to him for refuge, for then he shall be born into the noblest of royal houses in his next life, and be pro prosperous and have great honor from other kings. 
Oh, I end of the house of Puru. The Gustavus from Payana himself told me all these words. Remembering what he said, I made my decision. I, I guess um, that is. I, I want to stop here for a second because that is something that I still don't completely understand. What what is said by uh, Maharata, let's say, is, um, so to speak, written in destiny? It cannot be avoided? Or is, is it a possibility for people, let's say, to avoid what destiny tells they are to create and all of that? Now, I do not know one. It, it is weird, it is weird. I, I hope it can have a... It, it, it isn't that I hope, I know everything will, will go well, taking into account how many, um, let's say, power-ups has had Bima, it is very obvious that he will win. So yeah, let me, I, I think, I am not going to leave after the next one, but I will need to take a second uh, bathroom break, so let me try to speed up this. Cut uh, <coughs> 165, Laun, Frisira is contrite. He says, Mother, what you have done is wise and excellent. Or Bima will certainly kill the Rakshasa and come back alive, not only for his indomitable strength, but for our mother's unfaltering kindness towards Brahmanas. But Mother, you must get the Brahmanas soul and pledge that he will say nothing of this to anyone else. But Sambayana continued, at dawn the next day, Bima Sena set out for the Rakshasa Lea with a cartload of fine food which the Brahmanas wife has prepared. As he goes towards the forest where the Rakshasa lives, Bima himself begins to eat, and how he releases the Brahmana woman's cooking. As he eats, the great Pandava begins to roar out of the Rakshasa, the Rakshasa's name, to taunt him. Baka hears him and flies out in rage from his cave towards the impertinent Cartman. He is immense, as is his strength. His eyes are red, and so are his hair and beard. He is altogether terrible, as he strides alone, his foot marks deep upon the earth. His mouth stretches from one ear to the other, and his ears are sharp, pointed like arrowheads. Three deep furrows mark his deep brow. The Rakshasa arrives where Bima sits contently, eating the food. Baka bites his lip and glowers. Softly, in a voice full of menace, he says, Who is this fool that dares eat my food before my very eyes? Who is this fool that wants to see Yaman look at once? Bima only smiles in contempt and continues eating. He does not so much as turn to look at Rakshasa. Baka gives the most dreadful roar, thrusts out his long hirsute arrows and rushes at Bima. Bima Parantapa gives him just one brief glance, then goes back to eating the Rakshasa's food with indeed relish. Baka strikes Brikodara a tremendous blow from behind, smiting him with two clenched fists. Kunti's son does not steer, he, does, he still does not look at the Rakshasa, only continues to eat. Beside himself, Baka tears up a tree and advances upon Bima again. Meanwhile, Brikodara finishes the last of the great meal. He washes his hand and now turns with a smile to face the Rakshasa, ready at last to fight him. Baka casts the tree like a shovel in at Bima, who catches it in his left hand. More trees, Baka tears up and casts them in a fair blizzard at the Pandava. Bima also now pulls up trees and casts them at the monster. Soon, the entire forest around the dreadful two is the nudest of trees. Baka roars, I am Baka, and he springs at Bima and seizes him with his hands. Bima seizes the Rakshasa too, and they begin to drag each other about violently. The ground shakes beneath their great feet, and the trees they cast at each other snap in pieces and are crushed. Baka dies quickly, and Bima flings him down on the ground, holding him down with his knees, and begins to rain awesome blows on the Subin Rakshasa. Then, in a flash, he throws back on his face, plants one knee on his spine, and sees the Rakshasa snake in one hand, and his waist cloth in the other begins to bend him back into. Bagas scream and roars shake that place. Rahan, he vomits blood as Bima inexorably breaks his neck. What the fucking incredible depiction of... Uh, it feels almost as if this was uh, the next level of a Bucky fight, you know, uh, it is in, in that same realm, I, I, I think. 
amazing. I, I can, I can, I think that there is, okay, it has two sides. The biggest good thing and at the same time, the worst part of this is if you cannot put what is being read in in a visual thing that you can properly say, yeah, I enjoy this, you will never have the possibility of saying, yeah, this what this thing which I am seeing, I can properly um, enjoy. And in, in, because of that same reason, or that very reason, it, it, is, it is amazing when you can, uh, so to speak, create in your imagination a, a better adaptation of this. But at the same time, if you can't, you are very fucked. Because it really relies even more with so many of the descriptions that there are here. So, it, it relies on the imagination. I think, I, think, I, I don't know. Uh, let, me, let me go to the water. Let me, let me go to the water. Uh, because uh, I literally stayed for a second just to praise this fucking book. Amazing. Let me see, let me see. We are on the count of 166. Amazing. And yeah, I mean, I literally left with the idea that this is incredibly amazing. So yeah, let us continue a little bit more in that same note. Oh, wait, did I forget myself? In case, yeah. Okay, okay. Can't do 166. But My Sampayana said, finally, with, with a resounding crack, back as back breaks, and with the last scream, the Rakshasa, big as a hill, dies. Terrified by the sound of the battle, back as kinsmen run out. Rahan, they come a, a, with their servants to see what the mother is and find their lord broken upon the ground and his slayer standing over him. <clears throat> Seeing them terror-stricken, trembling and grieving, Bima confronts them, but he says, Never again kill a manava, for if you do, you will also die as Baka has died. Two Rakshasa say, So be it, giving their solemn word. And indeed, from that day on, the people of Ekachakra in that entire region find those Rakshasas gentle towards humankind, those of the humans that do not fly that country after they see Baka killed by the mighty Bhima. Bhima brings Baka's course back to Ekachakra, 
Hun observed he leaves the great carcass at one of the town gates by Tarak and the returns to the house of the Brahmana, where he tells Yudhishthira what has happened. Next morning, some people of the Kachakra come out and see the heavy Rakshasa covered in blood and death, saying how he has been mangled by whoever killed him. Their hair stands on end. They run back into the town and the news spread like wildfire. Now the people come out in thousands, men, women and children, to the gate where the Rakshasa lies like a fallen cliff. They stand stand by the side and at the thought of who will have done this thing. Rahan, those people give fervent thanks to other gods, and then they begin to think whose turn it was to take the cart of food the previous day to Baka. Soon they arrive in the house of the good Rahmana and demand to know what has happened. At first, he will say nothing, but when they press him repeatedly, the, that Brahmara in Shabha says yesterday, Abrahamana, a master of mantras, saw me crying with my family at the fate that had overtaken us. He asked me why we wept, and when I told him, he consoled me, smiling me, and said, Fear nothing, for I will take his food to the Rakshasa. <clears throat> at first, I will not allow him, but she assured me that he will come to no harm. Surely, he has looked back and has done all a great service. All the Brahmanas and Satriyas of Ekachagra are wonderstruck at the Vaisyas and the Sudras and so results. Indeed, they decide to mark that day with a festival to worship the Brahmana stranger who had freed them from the terror of Baka. <coughs> pretty, I, I would say, yeah, pretty amazing, you know? Pretty, pretty fine. Let me see. Uh, how, how much do we have? Uh, what the fuck? This is ultra short. Let me, let me write this one then. Eh, Canto 167, Chaitra Ratra Parva, by Sampayana continue. After the slaying of Baka and the ceremony they hold to celebrate the amazing feat by the unknown Brahmana, the people of Eka Chakra go back to their homes and return to their daily lives. Kanamekaya asks, Brahmana, what did the Pandavas, those Purusha Vyagras, do after the king Baka Rakshasa? By Sampayana said, Rahan, they continue to live in the house of the new Brahmana, who constantly studies the Veda. A few days later, yet another austerous Brahmana arrives in the home of the Pandavas host, always sinners to a fault. The Ekachaka Brahmanirash Brahmanirishaka welcomes the visitor and makes him stay in his own home. Hearing from their host that the newcomer is a gifted rack counter, the one evening Kunti and her sons ask him to tell them them about his wanderings and experiences. The Brahmana begins by telling them about his journeys and pilgrimage through various lands, their holy shrines and theaters and rivers of great beings that he has met and he speaks and describes many wonderful kingdoms and cities. When he has done this, O Hanamekaya, the Brahmana begins to tell them about the forthcoming Swayambara of the daughter of the Padayagnasena of the Pacharas. He describes the unusual words of what? What the fuck? What uh, the Give me a second. Ah, I, I was completely messing up this, obviously. The Yumna and Sikhandi, one of the princes Krishna Draupadi, who also is born not from a woman, but from a holy fire to the great Yana that Drupada performs. Their curiosity aroused to hear about the extraordinary events in Drupada life, the Pandava Purusha Purara, what the fuck Purusha Rishabhas asked the Brahmana, Brahmana, who was the Harita Shuina, born from a Yagna fire, who was his sister Krishna, born from the herd of the Yagna Shala, who did the Harita Shuina acquire the astras from the peerless Acharya Drona? And O oh, Brahmana, who did Drupada and Drona become enemies? And the itinerant Brahmana tells them about the exceptional build of Draupadi. And wait. Uh, let me see. Uh, yeah, okay. This is a retelling of a story that we already went over, so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the me from the future will have to deal with this. I, I am not willing to deal with this shit. Uh, we had a great time so far, so we are not going to end this in a kind of sad note. 
because we will end up going over once again something that we are ready right? so yeah let me let me see um do we have something like how, how long it is at the very least i want to know okay it seems it finally adds a little bit more on that story but with this we'll have to deal with the yes, scandal so yeah it will be something for the me of the future to deal with not uh, the actual one so yeah let me here that's it that was was an incredible day I, I think i feel like it was mm, very very nice very very good very 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 nice you know very in a sense very clear about mm, not clear what the fuck very enjoyable experience um, so yes, i i can only say thanks as always for this let me because I, I want to copy this I, I, I have already been forgotten about copying the canton which we left this, so we, let me copy that and well, I think that's it, that's it so far. This has been a very nice stream, but once again we are, um, the, so to speak, the right to live. We are, and we acquire the possibility of resting so far because yeah, we, we, can't, we can't really go for so long. We don't really accept it. We were exhausting ourselves mentally and even more physically sometimes. So yeah, it was a good occasion. It was as always a beautiful thing to have and even more, <coughs> so to speak, a great thing to, to deal with. And yeah, I, I can't really say anything else. I, I think we don't have the possibility to rain, right? Yeah, yeah. We, we don't really have it, so... Uh, oh, well, let, let me see, let me see. Just in case. Do we have somebody? I couldn't try to run I... Let me see, let me see. Let me check, let me check properly. Because I also wanted to say, as always, it is a very big pleasure to, to do this. As always, it is uh, a very enjoyable thing to be here. And even more, um, it has been a very, very great thing so far. Even more, because, you know, everything has been going pretty, pretty well. So, yeah, we kind of... We kind of have the, dealt with these situations very easily. We, we might as well try to rest a little bit. Thanks, for, well, uh, before I say that, thanks as always for paying attention, thanks for being here, thanks for, for everything, you know. We now just should try to take a little break. When the next possibility arises, because yeah, we're not going to ride anybody, when the next possibility arises, we are going to see what we do, but yeah, so so far that's it, that's it. Thanks, thanks for everything, people. As always, if it wasn't for you, this wouldn't be happening. So yes, thanks for every single thing. Now, for real, let me in this situation end it. And yes, as I, as I was saying, thanks. When the next opportunity arises, we are going to find each other. So far, now it is time to take a break and to rest a little bit. So yeah.